He wants that for us. He wants us to experience Him in us and through us. And that by itself is mind-blowing. He wants for us to share His, share with Him in His identity, in His image, in His likeness. Hear my words as God's. As God's. And that's where we need to grow in. We need to grow in this. You, you need to grow into His identity. You need to grow into His image, into His likeness as God's. And my prayer is, my prayer is just this, that we will grow in this grace and in this mercy that, is, that, that we've received from Him. So from me this morning, I want to say thank you for you to be here. Thank you that you are here. If you are here for the first time, thank you that you are here. Thank you that you separated yourself this day from the rest of the people. Simply for this purpose of hearing God's word and getting to come to a place where you can know what's God's intentions for your life. Thank you that you are here. It would never be in the same if you were not here. If it was me and my wife or me and the woman of God and the camera, it would not have been the same. But you are here. Can I say it again? Thank you that you separated yourself from all the other people. To come to this place. This morning I want to bless you. This morning I want to take you. To a place. Of understanding. I want to bring something to you. That you will understand. You will need to understand this. If you looked at the. The heading of my topic for today that says, The God that ignores prayers. Then I can just imagine what, what goes through the mindset of people because you and I were taught that God answers all prayers. And that's true. He do. But God is not answering all prayers. <laughs> And now, now we have to look why. Why? So I want to help this morning with this. We are here to learn, to study God's Word so that we become better in everything that we do. So that this entire process of us becoming God's not be delayed by means of or because of a lack of knowledge. Remember last week I said something. I said that Isaiah 4 verse 6 says that my people, God speaks to his people. And he says my people are, are going astray. They are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And we understand the concept when I say if God would say to us, my people, he will say, my, 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 my sons and my daughters, my children are destroyed. And I want to explain this thing to you this day. The whole emphasis of last week was much on knowing, knowing, knowledge, knowledge of God. Knowing, you, we, you have to get to know God. So I want to go on with that. But I just want to say this again, so that we can, in this process that we are in, becoming the gods that God called us. And we don't want to delay the process of becoming that because of a lack of knowledge. For some people, when I say gods, they grasp the idea 
and they, they take hold of the idea of, of us being gods. Some are still battling with that name that God gave us. When he gave us and he said that I call you gods. Some struggle with that. And for others, they are still in the process of becoming and being. So that's why we have to keep on educating our people along these lines. It is a constant place of getting educated. You see, church, it is not that simple. When you give your life to Jesus, you're getting born again. It, the, the process did not stop there. For many people, the process stopped there. Hallelujah. They're going to get golden wings and they're going to fly and they're going to go to heaven. They're going to have a, a brawl of time in heaven. No, it's not. It's not like that. We have to keep on educating our people. Now, so when we come to the place of praying for at least one hour a day, the importance of that is this. The understanding and the knowledge of the God that you pray to. When it comes to prayer, there is so many questions. There's so many things to ask and to be answered when it comes to prayer. And I want to clarify something on prayer this morning. Prayer, we know this, is our lifeline. Prayer is a mechanism spiritually that is keeping us alive and it's keep us breathing. That's what prayer does. But now, in prayer, the focus is not supposed to be to get. You hear what I'm saying? The focus of prayer, when we pray, the focus is not supposed to be to get. The focus is supposed to be to know. I don't pray to get. I pray to know him. So now, having spiritual experiences, it's a discussion that we've discussed many a times amongst us as leaders, as people together, that we have some spiritual experiences. And now, having some spiritual experiences, or rather, let me say it, maybe in the past, you had spiritual experiences and it came to a point where that what you've experienced is no longer occurring in your life. If you can relate, I want you to hear what I'm saying. If you, if you don't relate, you're going to get to that place where you will. You hear what I'm saying? You had some spiritual experiences with God. Some places, some crazy stuff that you experience with God. And now you are in a place where that is no more. It's like, what happened? It's gone. You don't have those over the rooftop spiritual experiences anymore. And now you may ask, what is it that triggered those experiences that you once had? And what is it that caused them to cease? What causes it to start? And what causes it to stop? Can I ask the question again? What causes those experiences that you once had, that you experience is no more, what caused it to start and what caused it to stop? A mindset. Let me explain it. You had the spiritual experiences in the spirit. And God was so pertinent in all of those experiences. 
He was there. He, he, he was visible. He was tangible. He was tasteable. He was smellable. He was there. You could touch him. You can feel him. His presence was so thick. The cloud was so thick. The presence was there. But it ceased. And now what you think is, is that you have lost it. I've lost those experiences that I once had. I've lost it. It was there. I was there. It was so real. It was there. And now it's no longer happening anymore. So now, because you feel like you've lost those spiritual experiences, what happens now is you, you, you kind of start to experience or feel like that I've been detached from God. That something came in, in between me and God. That connection that I used to have with God is no more there. That connection, it's lost. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are you here with me? Okay. And what you actually feel is, is that, is that because you don't experience those experiences anymore, you, you, you don't go into the heavens, you, you, you don't go onto the chariot ride, you don't, you don't mingle with angels anymore, you don't sit with Jesus physically, and, all, and now you think, because these things isn't happening anymore, that you have lost God. You not only th you, you don't think that you've lost an experience, you think that you have lost God. So if that experience is not to be retained, if I cannot get it back, I'm searching the whole time for that experiences. I want it back. I want those three, four, five hours with God back. I want those times back where God took me to places and I saw things. I want that back. And now, if it's not retained, people will keep on struggling with their relationship with God as if there has been a separation from God because there's a separation from an experience. Yellow. Fronts. And when that happening is, and what and, and when that happening is, is because you hear me, you have not been able to distinguish the difference between the experience that you are having in the spirit and God. That's a different confusion. But there's a difference. Because we can attach an experience and believe that that experience is God. And the danger is now is that when that experience, if you don't experience it anymore, that you think you've lost the relationship. Yet, you still have God, the God of the experience. But it's now that is giving you a new experience, which might even be greater than the ones that you have before. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Maybe my, my attack is a little bit deep. I don't know. I've seen many people coming to church. I saw many people coming vibrant. People that are so, so eager for God, so on fire for God. And six months later, they're out of church. I've seen people that say, that God is my everything. And somewhere along the line, they just lost it.
They make altar calls. People come and stand here in the front and they experience for that 5, 10, 20 minutes, they experience a presence that they've never experienced before. They, 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 they feel physically, they feel the heaviness of God's weight upon their lives. And when they don't feel it tomorrow or the day after that, they think God's gone. They feel like, what happened? Why is God attaching himself unto me now and tomorrow he's not there? Where is he? Why did he deattach himself? Why, isn't, why can't I feel what I feel felt on Sunday? Why can't I feel it tomorrow or a week from now? This is what I'm talking about. Those experiences. All of us has been there. We've all been there. The day that you gave your life to Jesus, something happened that day that you felt. It was like an, the feeling is like, wow, he's real. He's here. He's touching me. He's full. I'm, I'm, I'm just feel like I'm walking on eggs on the, in the air. It's just amazing what I feel. Do you remember those days? It happened there when you, when you said, Lord Jesus, here I am. I'm receiving you as my, as my Savior. Now I'm going to follow you. And now I'm going to try to get to know you. I'm going to learn about you. It's that born again feeling. That born again excitement that you had. And sometimes he would pray and God would like, Poo, like this. He would answer. It's like an, an immediate thing. He answers when you ask him something. He just goes and he, he answers your prayers. I remember. I remember leading a guy to Jesus. And uh, he was like an, coming into my office. He says, you know what? You know what's crazy? Every time I pray, I'm getting it. So whatever you want from God, just ask me. I will pray. He will give it. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And now, 10 years along the line, you pray, nothing happens. <laughs> it's like, God, Father, I need a job. Oops, you've got a job. There's no wedding time. He just goes ahead and he just do it. It felt like, you know what, this is, this is so great. This is, oh, can you imagine spending time with God? You pray and it happens. And we felt like we were in a place where we are mature. And God is just interested in us. He's interested in our lives. Sometimes he was responding fast because he never wanted to lose us because we were not yet mature. But then, when you mature, God wants for you to come and communicate with Him. Talk to Him in the right language. He wants you to speak to Him the way a mature person speaks. Let's hear what Paul says. In 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11 he says, When I was a child... I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away the childish things. There's a language that you have to grow in. You have to grow in that language, in that way of communicating with God. There comes a time 
when God ignores most of the things that you are saying in prayer simply because you are not using the language of maturity. Unlike the first days, unlike the times when you, when you were just saved and you just pray and God was not really concerned. He was not concerned about you having praying the right way. That didn't matter to him. All that was needed at that time was it, it, the right person was needed to pray. And that right person was the person that's born again. And born again made you the right person. And praying the wrong way, God still answered your prayers. But there comes a time when God's focus now is on maturity. He focuses on your maturity. And He wants you to move into a place where your vocabulary is improved. He wants you to start speaking and communicating with Him in a developed way of maturity. He wants you to be upgraded. And when that time finally comes, He has to ignore most of your prayers. So that you can find out and realize that the way that you're speaking is not the way that God speaks. You cannot be 30 years in the church, 40 years in the church, walking a, a, a walk of maturity, declaring that I'm a, a mature Christian and still speaks like a baby in the spirit. You cannot be baby always. There's no way that you can grow in the spirit and still ask us a baby. There's no way. Maybe, maybe I've not been asking well. Maybe I'm begging. And that is not the nature of a king. Because in the mouth of a king, there's power. There's no power in the mouth of a slave. There's no power in the mouth of a servant. You know what I'm saying? So, we know, when you get to a point where you have to speak like a king, so that you can start commanding power, would you keep saying things like a slave? You will not have the response of the king of kings. Pastor Kovas asked this morning, who had a storm this week or this month, you see, when you find yourself in that storm, it's in the mouth of a king that there's victory because there's no power in the mouth of a slave. Majority of Christians, when they're in a storm, they are powerless. Because they forget all that they learned. And they go back to being a slave. God is not responding to slaves. He's responding to kings. Because he's the king of kings. So when that time comes... You start experiencing delays in some of the things that you pray for. It is not any more snappy. God, I need a breakthrough now. 
if it was 20 years ago when you just started following Jesus, you would have had it immediately. But now you come to a place and you are still struggling with the same things and you are praying the same prayers and you want the same breakthroughs and God is ignoring that. Because somewhere in your maturity, in your growth, you have to start learn another vocabulary so that you can start speaking like a king and not like a slave. And that's in that moment that you feel like you've lost an experience. I've lost an experience. That's what I had in prayer. God answered it immediately first. And I've lost that. Where is God now? You see, but comparing the two scenarios, you are now more mature. Now, when God seems to be ignoring you prior to the times that you thought you were mature, because God's quick response is towards what you said. Listen, listen here. So maturity can actually bring that delay in your life to the sum of the results that you are expecting or anticipating for. The things that you want to happen, the fact that you grow, the fact that, you, that God wants you to mature, there can be a delay to those answers. See, we, we, we love comparing ourselves to others. And the Bible says it's not wise. It's not wise to compare yourself. This is what Christians do. I've heard these millions of times. The reason why prayer meetings are the least of all meetings in attendance is because of this. I cannot pray like Magda. I cannot pray like that one. I, I don't have all that words. I don't have those. You are comparing yourself. And God says it's not wise. You are comparing yourselves to others. Christians compare themselves to others. You know what? Every time he prays, something happens. But when I pray, I have to wait so long. Hear this. It could be that maturity is causing the delay to your answered prayers. Hear this. Hear this one. And it can be because of immaturity that causes these answers. To God's response to these answers to be immediate. Because some of you want to copy your neighbor who is yet to mature in the things of God. You want to do things the way he's doing things. Say things he's, the way he's saying things. And because of that maturity now, it doesn't happen in your life. Because that's what you're asking for, you don't get. Because it's not to get. It is, you just need to do it. So God might not be really that swift in providing certain answers that he knows you know so the responsibility has shifted to you because God is expecting you to act mature God take me out of this and he's not going to take you out God do this for me he's not going to do it for you because you know you know you have to do it yourself. Because you are mature. You are no, more, no longer a baby in the house. 
that if you're hungry, we have to cook for you. Hear this. All that you need to do is to cry and somebody will jump up and down and preparing something for you so that you can eat. But when you are growing to maturity, you're not supp even supposed to tell us you're hungry. Because you know where the stove is. You know where the pantry. You know where the food is. Go and make your own food. So prayer is not expected by the parent from a mature daughter saying, I'm hungry. Because she knows where the pantry is. She knows how to prepare food for herself. So if she cries like a baby, that's the kind of cry that we are supposed to ignore as parents. Some things that we go through in life, the attention is, is that, please help me. Some of those things is to be ignored by the parent. Because you know what to do. You know where the pantry is. You know where the food is. Just go and make it yourself. Eat. I've raised a question Wednesday evening with the leaders. I'm asking this. When do I ask you, if I go to my wife and I say to her, please pray for me. Do I say, please pray for me? Or do I say, please pray with me? Because there's a difference. What is your expectation when I ask you to pray for me? If you want me to pray for you, I will pray for you. I will pray that you'll get the sin out of your life so that you can go on. But if you want me to pray with you, I will pray that God will give you the wisdom. You hear what I'm saying, church? So if she cries like a baby, that's the kind of cry that we are supposed to ignore as parents. Looking at the maturity of the one crying. So she must not be tempted into copying a baby. Why is it when she cries that everyone is just running, jumping up and down? What response is he looking for? That's what most Christians do. How come he prays and suddenly God is just up and running, making sure that he gets his answers? It's because he's still young in the faith. When you are mature and you cry, God has to ignore your prayers. Because that is not what maturity is supposed to do for you. Rise up. Do what you do and do it to the best. Because you have to grow to that level where you know that what you are asking God is not going to do it for you because He already has done it for you. So it's kind of tricky because the people that we admire, we're looking at people and we ad ad admire their spirituality. You know what you admire many times? Their immaturity. You have to grow into the things of God. And that is going to help you. I remember the time where people seem spiritually so sensitive to the things of the Spirit. 
seeing devils in everything. And when it comes to warfare, spiritual warfare, the things that they in, encounter. And then when you look from the outside into and you thought, wow, that is so spiritual. You know what? It was their level of immaturity that you seen. I'm busy encouraging the house. For believers that encountered silence, where they used to hear God audibly, and now suddenly they encountered silence, they encountered blindness, they don't see the things that they saw anymore. If you can relate with this, it is like the interpretation of that from our sides is like God is not interested in talking to us anymore. But what you have to understand is that it is not that he's not interested in talking to us. But he's not interested in the way that we communicate. Because there's a better way of communication. And he expects from us to communicate to him, with him, on the base of our maturity. And that better way might be that when you mature, that even the silence of God becomes the voice of God. I want you to stay with me. The silence of God becomes the voice of God. Stay with me what I'm saying. So maturity brings you to a place of knowing. Can I say that again? Maturity brings you to a place of knowing. And I will explain this. Stay with me. I'm going a little bit deeper. Gabriel. The archangel Gabriel, he has the ability to extract information from God without God having to tell him anything that he needs to go and say. There's Michael, the archangel Michael. He has an understanding of a part of God that fights. The part of God that brings judgment to, to particular nations. He has access to that. He's not being told by God verbally. Michael, go and execute and engage into that conflict in that nation. No. But he has to read that part of God that wants to fight. And then he gets instruction, instructed by that part of God that's silent. So technically he becomes the part of God that fights. Yes, it is. He is a part of God that fights. And that part of God that fights is not the kidney. It's Michael. You know what I'm church? Please hear me. I want to help you with stuff. I really want to help you with things. We are not losers. We are not losers. We are, you don't know what you have. You don't know who you are. You don't know what you can do. It's time that the church arise. It's time that the church exchange their diapers and they, they, they baby grows for dancing clothes and start dancing on the glass in the sea of glass and stop keeping themselves busy with potty training. You know, if you keep yourself busy with potty training, there's a, there's a stink always. It's time to, to be in a place of jubilee, to dance. But you cannot dance with a diaper on. That is a part of God that fights. So Michael collects information concerning warfare from that part of God that fights. So now when, when Gabriel comes and he stands in the presence of the Lord... Sometimes he comes in and he walks away from the presence of God, knowing what God wants to say, but God did not say anything. Because, you know, there's a danger to that. 
When Michael comes in and he stands there by God. When Gabriel comes in and he stands there by God. He is not alone with God. There's other beings surrounding the throne of God. So now how is it that they, they come to get to know God? And Gabriel walks in. He stands there in the presence of God. And he walks away from God. And the other beings that's there with him does not know what God said to, to Gabriel. And God did not speak to him. But he received information from God. There are messages that are being brought to the earth that most angels are not even aware of. And they are right there in God's presence. But how is it then communicated? How is it communicated? This level of communication that we have What we do is we have to open our mouths. Because it's, it's part of the spiritual languages that, that's in the spirit. Gabriel has to stand in the presence of God, in the presence of other angelical beings. And he walks out there without God speaking, but he walks out with a message into his assignment. How does it work? How does it work? Because he's got access to the mind of Christ. He's got access to the intellectual, into the intelligence of God. Hear what I'm saying, just please. I'm giving this because sometimes you think that because God is silent, you feel like God has left the place. How come is God so quiet? Why is he not speaking? Why isn't he saying anything? Yet Gabriel... At, the, at his level, even when God is silent, he extracts in messages from him, information from God. And he comes out of the present, presence of a silent God with an assignment. And he, and, he, and he shows himself to Zechariah and he says, To Zechariah, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I'm standing before you, not because of what I heard, but because of what I was standing for. When I was standing in the presence, what I do is, I know. I, I, I hope I don't lose you. How does it help God? All these things. I believe that God desires from us deeper levels of maturity. That he doesn't have to anymore speak to us. Tell us, do this, do this, do this, go there, be that. But when you are in the presence of God, without him speaking, you know exactly what he wants you to go and do. I had a guy... A friend of mine, we used to, to, to go to gym together. And then Rihanna would ask me, what did you and Henry spoke about? I said, nothing. She said, but why didn't you speak? What, 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 you, you're going to two hours to the gym and you don't speak. I said, yeah, we don't need to speak. Because it's just enough to be with one another. God desires for us to come to that place of that level of maturity where we no longer has to, to, to be busy talking. Where he, he, he don't have to talk to us so that we can hear. But that we can just be there in his presence like Gabriel and without talking, information is transferred. You see, that's the generation of maturity of the gods 
that God wants to work with in the earth. Those that understand what he's doing through you. Not that he spoke to you, but that you just experience him. And you understand the temperature of God, the frequency. You understand the intentions of God. And you go and you preach a sermon, not what you've heard, but what you felt. While you were standing in his presence. Let me explain it a little bit different. Regarding what I've said. Let me bring you to the understanding of the body and its organs. You know, when you want your hand, when you want your hand to reach out and touch this, you are not going to say to your hand, hand, I want you to go and reach out and touch this. The hand is automatically doing what the mind is thinking because the hand is part of the body. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're part of God, you will know exactly what God wants you to do without Him telling you what to do. You don't say hand, reach out and touch. No, you don't do that. The hand has a way of doing that without me communicating to the hand verbally. Because it's part of my being, part of me. So whatever has been thought in the mind, it has been sent to the hand. Not in a verbal form. Internally. No no other member of the body heard what the mind said to the hand. Gabriel standing in front of God in the presence. And no other angel hear what God is transferring, transporting unto Gabriel because nothing was said verbally. All that the hand needs to do is is to connect. It is the connected. It needs to be connected to the brain that is thinking. And because of that connection, suddenly there's a movement. I'm asking which part of the body are you? What member of his body are you? Because that will definitely help with the assignment that you are called for. Once you know that you are the hand, we said it many times, you've heard sermons on this many times, that the body consists of many members. One guy is the ear, one other guy is the hand, other one is the foot, and the hand doesn't say to the foot, I don't need you. We've heard those sermons. So if you are the hand, then you know that holding is your responsibility. Touching is your assignment. If you are the ear, you know that you have to specialize in hearing. But that takes time. It takes time for that part of the body to grow into that. You will immediately get to understand that if you are the leg, then I'm responsible for movement. So if you say, I don't know my assignment, it means even your identity in Christ, you're not aware of it. So when you look at Christ, yes, I want to give you that something that's so profound. When you look at Christ, most people are not aware of what I'm going to say. I I shared a little bit on Wednesday evening with the leaders. 
this knowledge of God, our knowledge of God that we have, the knowledge of God that you have is the reason why you keep on fighting. Even as God's children. Keep on fighting each other, keep on fighting things. Because it's based on our misunderstanding of a God that can be understood. Paul wrote this and he says, Act 17. He says, For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar which with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiping with men's hands, as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath and all things. Many people serve the God that they don't know. Now, stay with me. I've got my little cosplay here. I want to show you something today. We know the scripture in Matthew 26, verse 26. We've been using it for communion so many times. When Jesus breaks the bread, what does it imply? What does breaking the bread imply? The scripture says, and as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed the bread and he broke the bread. And he gave them pieces. Is that true? And he said to his disciples, this is my body. It is broken for you. When you read that passage, you have to understand it, how, how it's been dramatized to the place where it is, especially with the implication of it's been spiritual also. You see, Jesus never did something just because of doing things. We know, we know what happened at salvation. We know that the remission for sin was through the blood. It was the blood that saved us. It is the blood that washed away our sin, not the body. It would only be the blood for sin to be washed away. So now, the body, where does the body come in at salvation? Because there's a breaking of the body. And then there's the blood that washes away our sin. The remission for sin because of the blood. 
But now we have to understand what's happening with the body. Jesus breaks the body. He breaks the bread, which is his body, and then he gives the broken body piece for piece to the disciples. Peace for peace to the disciples. Jesus breaks the bread and he gives the broken pieces, piece for piece, to the twelve. He has given them a piece, each of his body. So each disciple get to taste a part of his body. Each disciple get a taste of part of the body that the other person has got no idea of. So each disciple gets a taste of part of the same body, not a different body, the same body that the next disciple has got no idea of. Now, which might result in them having disagreements when it comes to the taste of the body, which is the reason why Christians fight. Because each person wants the God that he has tasted. <laughs> Michael encountered the God that fights. But he has not encountered the God who is giving the messages. Jesus broke his body and he gave unto each of the twelve a piece of his body. So now, people want you to talk about God, the God that they know. You want me to preach about what you have experienced? A peace that was given unto you. For most preachers, they think that they've got the only peace. They think that they've got the only peace of the body that there is. They think that they understand that Can I say this? <laughs> this is crazy. If you get an evangelist in the church, and he comes and he come and minister evangelistically in the church, he will let you know that there's only evangelists because it's the peace that he has. If an apostolic guy comes in and he ministers apostolically, he, he lets you know that it's the only thing that there is is the apostle because it's the peace. That he has. The same with the prophet. It's the peace that he has. And when he's finished ministering that, you think, gee whiz, we need some evangelists in the church. Maybe the church must become now apostolic. Because it's the peace. Understand when the body is broken. So now you might say, but, but when we got born again, we received 
all of him. Did you receive all of him? Yes. You receive the fullness of Christ. The fullness of him. So how come do you say that I only have a piece? How come you come and say that? Why are you talking just about pieces? Let me explain it. Let me remind you that when he broke the bread, when he broke the bread, which is his body, all of him, all of Christ, all of Jesus, were there breaking the bread. He was the one breaking. He was breaking him in pieces. And they were seated there. They were sitting there all together in the presence of him, in the presence of all of him. And now, all of him breaks part of himself and he distributes it to each one of them according to certain abilities. <laughs> he gave unto one, let's say, John, dear John, because you love to lie on my chest. Yeah, Judas. He gave unto them pieces according to their taste. And according to their hunger. Not everybody got the same. The day that you give your life to Jesus, you did not get whole bread. You got a piece according to your taste and according to your hunger for him. Matthew 5 or 6 says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's a blessing to be hungry. So the hunger that you have for the body will determine how much of his body you will consume. How many pieces of him will be offered to you as experiences. Some people don't have any spiritual experience because the peace that they receive It's all about your hunger for him. If you're not hungry for him, you will not have experiences. So my hunger for him has given me more access to several parts of the same God. All of us have him. All of him was there. Yet he broke his body and gave them pieces. And so while you are tasting him, while you are consuming him, you must be aware as a child of God of certain pieces that your neighbor might have and consume that you are not aware of. There are spiritual experiences that are experienced in the spirit that you haven't tasted yet. Because your level of hunger is not there to bring you into that peace. So that you can have the same experience. So what you have is not all you have. What you have is what you know. So while you are tasting him, consuming him, be aware as a child of God that there's pieces 
that the people around you, that your neighbors are consuming, that you are not aware of yet. You have to give him time to explain that experience that he has and not argue about that. But if you want to experience what he has experienced, if you want to experience what he has experienced, if you want to experience what he has experienced, become hungry. Because you will never have that if your capacity for that taste has not come. That is why I'm comfortable when I sit with people and they tell me that, listen, I've, I've been on the staircase. I've been on the, on the, on the, on the, on the stairwell. I've been sitting with Jesus. I'm good with that. Praise God for that, for that experience. And I will give you an opportunity to explain all those things, what you've experienced. But what I've got a problem with is, is this, is that when people start criticizing experiences that they've never experienced because they don't understand the peace they've got. And they come and say to you, listen, you cannot say that you've been in a chariot and that you're riding a chariot if you... God doesn't work like that. God isn't doing things like that. That is not God. I want to say to you, be careful what you say. Because what you've got, what you've received is according to your hunger. Because that's what people say. They say it because of the peace that they've tasted. And yet there's more. The body of Christ has been broken. His body has been broken so that you would have peace, a piece of his body. So there's more of his body that you have not tasted yet. So stop arguing about stuff. Stop arguing about things you don't understand. Become hungry. He did not give the entire loaf to any individual. We say that the, when, we, when, when, when it's communion time, we're getting very religious normally. We, we become very quiet, and there comes a, I don't know, a thing upon us that looks devilish. And then we, we, we find ourselves in a place of uncomfort being. And then we say, he broke his body so that we can be healed. And then the body of Christ is broken and sick. Because it's not understood. Because healing doesn't come outside of hunger. That healing that we use is because the hunger that you have, the more I can have Him, the more experience I can have Him, the more pieces I can have Him, that brings healing. So you can say, can I have all of Him? Yes, you can have all of Him. You've got it, all of him. If you're born again, you've got all of him. He's there. He's in you. He's with you. He's present. But you will not have a taste of all of him. As you increase in your hunger and your thirst, the more pieces are allocated unto you. That is why I've said, it's the part of God that you have known that manifests in your life. It's just the God that you know that manifests in your life. Nothing else. If, if, 
if he is, if, if you know that he is love, that's all that will manifest in your love, is love. Nothing more, no power, no discernment, because that's out of pieces. The rest of him will be there. It will be like Jesus is present, he's with you, he sits next to you, he's right with you, all of him next to you. And yet, you sink. You are busy drowning. Until you call out for help. And he reaches out, he, he stretches out his hand and he pulls you out of the, the water. Listen, you can die in the presence of God. You can die in his presence. Somebody can use an example of a prophet in the Old Testament. And they can say, yeah, but this prophet in the Old Testament was such a meek guy. He was, he was so God-fearing. And he was, he was really somebody that was so broken. He had no money. And, and then you bring that person out of there into the now. And you set him as a template. And you say... Everybody that fears God must be poor based on the prophet's experience. Listen, he only had a peace. He had a peace. And the peace that he had was the things about God that he chose to know. So the responsibility is ours as individuals to decide what you want to know about God. It's your decision. You decide that. There's more of God than what you have known. He's too big. The pieces that he has been given to you is determined by the, by the capacity, the interest that you showed at the time that the pieces was handed out to you. I know many people that gave their lives to Jesus. And it explained so many things to me that people got born again. They got born again, but they received just a little peace. Judas did not receive a peace like this because he did not love Jesus. He received this. Many people received a peace like this. And they think that they've got everything. They're going, hallelujah, golden wings, and we're going to fly into heaven and just going to have an awesome time while their life on earth is just hell. I understand why people are not hungry for God. Because of the peace. I understand why people, they, they're just crazy about Jesus. It's because of the, the peace. Your hunger was equivalent to the peace that was given to you. You increase your hunger. That is why that hunger becomes a blessing. We should pray for hunger. Because hunger is a blessing. Because it's the hunger that helps you to get more pieces of God. The peace that you received was equivalent to the hunger that you had. Remember many, many a, a year or two, three, four years ago, I said, not everybody loves Jesus and they're born again. That's it. They're born again. And we don't understand why they act like they act. Because of the peace they received. 
And there's no attempt to hunger for more. And now the experience that they experienced the day that they got born again, the thrill, the goosebumps, all these things is gone. And they think God's gone. They think God's not there. While he's there. And they are saved by the blood. Washed by the blood. But their pieces, there's never been an add-on to that. Because they were never hungry for more. Knowledge about God. Knowledge about the God that you pray to. Because the God that you pray to, the God that you spend time with, if you stand in His presence, You can walk away from there, know what to go and say, know what to go and do, without him speaking. Because that's the connection. But God doesn't speak to me anymore. And when I pray, it, f- it's, it feels like I'm praying to the ceiling. Hungry. Become hungry. You know, you're not looking for God. You're looking for a microwave. Just two minutes. We are in a busy life. We are in a busy life. There's a, there's a definite time of prayer set in the Bible by Jesus. And that's an hour. He says at least an hour. He spoke to his disciples say. You cannot even stay awake with me for an hour. He doesn't say about five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, that. He speaks about an hour. And then he speaks about three o'clock, nine o'clock, twelve o'clock. Three o'clock, afternoon. Three o'clock, morning. Nine o'clock, evening. Nine o'clock, morning. Twelve o'clock, noon. Twelve o'clock, midnight. It's prayer time. At least an hour. Because if you go and study those times, you will see every time miracles happen from out of that. But the body of Christ, they want, they want it like this. If you've been serving Jesus for a while, you will know that he's not going to respond to your snapping. He responds to your maturity. And it only comes by knowledge. Knowing Him. Knowing Him. And then by knowing Him, getting to know Him, it comes to places where We've been there where we wait on him and not dump a lot of stuff 
that he's not going to answer. He, well, he's not going to answer that. He just ignores it. If you are mature and you start crying like a baby before God, he ignores you. He ignores those prayers because his expectation is more from you than to cry like a baby. The body of Christ needs to become strong, church. We will always face something. The snake was never where there was no fruit. The snake was not where there was no fruit on the tree. The snake was there where there's fruit. You will always experience, never ever think that you're going to pray God and say, can I have a good, steady, quiet life? I promise you, if you're a baby, yes. But if he wants you to grow, you will never be there. Because he cannot afford to, to answer all your prayers. Because he's done stuff for you and in your life that you're supposed to do yourself. We're not babies. Hungry. I'm not going to do what I did the other night. I put a, a whole slice in my mouth because I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm not a trample over. No ways. And I'm not giving de the devil honor for nothing. If I grow, if I mature, if I mature, the devil is not my problem. The devil is not my problem. Jesus never walked around and say, oh, the devil, the devil here, the devil there, maybe he's behind the bush. Jesus didn't even freaking mind the devil. He didn't even care about the devil. I don't care about the devil because I know who my, my father is. Thank you, Father. Mature sons, daughters. The earth is waiting for the mature sons and daughters to manifest themselves in the earth. They are waiting. The, the earth is looking at the church. And they just see a bunch of weaklings. Father, we change that. We change that. Because this is the year of expansion. Of expanding our tents. Becoming stronger. Wider. This is the year of explosion in all areas of life. The pieces that we've received, we are hungry for the rest. There is more. We want that more. And we will have that. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand before you. That we can extract information from your presence without you speaking. Because 
we are one. I mean you, you and me, we are one. And I can just imagine, Father, how the Pharisees, when Jesus said, me and my Father, we are one, how they're just looking for stones, taking the stones up in their hands and just wanted to kill Jesus for that statement. Not because of the good works, but because he said, me and my Father, we are one. I declare, we are one. You and me, I mean you, we are one. And our hunger and our thirst, hunger and thirst for righteousness, hunger and thirst, growing to maturity. Wow, God, thank you, Father for this grace, this mercy upon our lives that we can come to that place of understanding and knowing you. I remember so well the scripture in Isaiah 55, 11 that says for the thoughts of God is not my thoughts and the ways of God is not my ways. Father, that was Old Testament. Nobody was born again there. They could not grow into you. They had to keep a law. And now we can grow into you. And you are in us. You are in us. And our hunger to you that's in us, make it available for us to say, Lord, I can know you. And I can understand you. And this process, I will walk in this. Thank you, Father, for our house. Thank you, Father, for every guest, for everyone that, that's guest to our house, for everyone that becomes family of CGC Ladysmith. I praise you, Father, for your plan, your purpose, your assignments that you've been given unto us as a house our destination we praise you father for a prophetic house we praise you father that that we can walk in the prophetic that we can walk in the seeing and in the hearing and we can also function in the silence because of what we know and understand. I praise you for it, Father, in Jesus' name.